Hi, I'm Nikki. Welcome to Alpha. Life is busy. Every day we ask so many questions. What should I wear? What's the weather going to be like? What's happening today? How am I going to fit everything in? But then there are those bigger questions. Like, why am I here? Where am I heading? Is this it? Is there more to life than this? These are life's big questions. But there's rarely enough time to think them through properly. We all have different perspectives on the meaning of life and faith. And Alpha is an opportunity to explore life's big questions. This is a great place to come together and talk about them openly and honestly. I'm Gemma. I'm Toby. And this is Alpha. Um, I go on Google. Google. I definitely Google. I go on Wikipedia. Internet. I uh, scroll through all the different answers and then I try and combine it and then make my own kind of cornerstone. Or smart friends. I don't ask big life questions. It's too hard to answer. Google or my grandmother. I meditate or I read. When I have a big life question, I probably go to my family. I haven't really had any mess of what this. To my mom or my dad. Basically. My mom and my dad, maybe my grand. I get most of my answers from the library in any section there because I don't really trust the people that I'm around. The key is always to yourself. You gotta figure some things out for yourself. If I'm confused, I go to him first. And he confuses me more. But when it's something more personal, I try to find it within myself first. Friends of mine told me that the first night they came to Alpha, they sat in their car for half an hour waiting and watching people going in. And eventually when they'd seen enough normal looking people going in, they thought they'd give it a try. And one thing that might be going through your mind is, am I going to be the only one there who doesn't believe all this stuff, who's not a Christian that doesn't go to church? Well, if that's you, then you're in the right place. Alpha is designed for people who wouldn't call themselves Christians or who are not regular churchgoers. It might feel a bit strange to be discussing life and faith with people that you've never met before. But the best thing about Alpha is often the great friendships that are formed over the weeks. For much of my life, I was not remotely interested in Christianity. In fact, I didn't think I'd ever come to something like Alpha. I was not brought up as a Christian. My father was a secular Jew. He was an agnostic. And my mother didn't go to church. Uh, and. I had no interest at all in Christianity. First of all, I just thought it was so boring. Everything to me about church, Christianity, religion was just dull and dreary. And it kind of made me feel a little bit guilty. I didn't know why, but I just didn't want to have anything to do with it. And I also thought it was untrue. I, I thought I'd sort of thought it through and uh, I'd come up with these intellectual objections and I called myself very pretentiously, I called myself a logical determinist. And I quite enjoyed arguing with people who called themselves Christians. And at university I had a bit of a reputation for being an argumentative atheist. And I also thought it was irrelevant to my life. I couldn't see how someone who'd lived 2,000 years ago, 2,000 miles away, could have any relevance to my life today. It just seemed outdated and irrelevant. But at the same time, looking back now, I would say something was missing. I say that because I don't think I was living in the moment. I was always looking forward to the next thing in life. So when I was at school, I was thinking, when I finish my exams, maybe that will be when I'm going to really start to enjoy life. I finished my exams, and then after about three weeks, I started to think, there's got to be more to life than this. And I thought, well, maybe when I've left school, that will be what life's all about. And then I left school, and after about three weeks, I started to think, there's got to be more to life than this. I thought, well, maybe the answer is to get a girlfriend. And somehow, I don't know how I managed it, but I managed to find a girlfriend. Again, after about three weeks, I started to think, there's got to be more to life than this. And, and basically, there was something missing. I was longing for more. The actor Jim Carrey once said, I wish everyone could get rich and famous and have everything they've ever dreamed of, so they would know that's not the answer. 
Some people dream of having their name in lights, of fame and fortune. Some people dream of finding happiness through relationships, careers, money, whatever it may be. But do you ever get that niggly feeling that as good as those things are, there must be more to life? Yeah, all too often life just doesn't turn out the way we think it should. And even when it does and we achieve our wildest dreams, it's somehow never quite enough. It just doesn't satisfy. It's like there's something missing. The comedian and actor Russell Brand said, drugs and alcohol are not my problem. Reality is my problem. Drugs and alcohol are my solution to fill up a hole inside me. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. In other words, I am the one who fulfills the longing that's deep inside every human heart. Jesus claimed to be the one person who can satisfy that spiritual hunger. Freddie Mercury, the lead singer of the rock group Queen, had amassed a huge fortune and attracted millions of fans. But he admitted in an interview shortly before his death that he was desperately lonely. He said this, you can have everything in the world and still be the loneliest man. And that's the most bitter type of loneliness. Success has brought me world idolization and millions of pounds, but it's prevented me from having the one thing we all need, a loving, ongoing relationship. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Ultimately, there's only one relationship that is totally loving and goes on forever, and that's a relationship with God. And Jesus said, I am the way to that relationship. Jesus said, I am the truth. Some people's response to a Christian might be, well, it's great for you, you found meaning and purpose in your life, but it's not for me. But when you think about it, that's not actually a logical position because if Christianity is true, it's of vital importance to every one of us. And if it's not true, it's not great for us because it means we're deluded. C.S. Lewis was one of the great intellectual giants of the 20th century, probably best known as the author of the Chronicles of Narnia. He said this, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. And if true, of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. I come from a family of lawyers, so naturally I wanted to look at the original documents and sources. I never really looked at the evidence before, and I was astonished at how much evidence there is for the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. For me, it was through reading these documents that we find in the New Testament that I came to the conclusion, it's true. Alpha is a place where you can be yourself. You can say what you think and challenge everything. No, no question is too complex or too simple. And what your point of view is, is as important as anyone else's. And over the weeks ahead, we are going on a journey together. An adventure to explore the questions of life, faith and meaning. Think of it this way. If you live to be 70, you're going to spend 20 years and three months asleep. 10 years and 5 months watching TV, 5 years and 9 months in some form of transportation, 7 years and 6 months eating and drinking. You have approximately 570,000 hours left to live, so why not spend less than 24 of them asking life's biggest questions? Welcome to Alpha. Well, I just echo Nikki Gumbel there. I just say welcome to our Alpha series. Just in case you don't know me, I'm Carl Mutzelberg. I'm the lead pastor of Catalyst here. And in the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the ins and outs of the Christian faith. Uh, for me, you might say it was easy concluding that the claims of Christianity are true. I come from a family of Christians. My father was a pastor, my grandfather a lay preacher and elder, and his father and father's father was a Christian. And my earliest memories are under seats just like this as a four or five year old trying to go to sleep while some Christian service of some type bled on around me. And um, while I've only got the vaguest memories of the event, my mother tells me that I committed myself to Christianity, to Jesus, uh, somewhere around the age of three. So you could say I was destined to forever be a part of this faith. But for me, somewhere around the age of uh, 15 or 16, I suddenly had all the reasonable questions I think a child would have as they begin to grow. And they went a bit like this, hang on a sec, what if I was born in China? 
Would I be a Buddhist? Or what if I was born in Iraq? Would I be a Muslim? Or forget that, what if I was just simply born next door with my mate who I play with you know, every single day, but uh, he doesn't go to church and his family seems perfectly happy. What about then? Where would I be in that situation? At the time, I remember they were really challenging questions and they rocked me for quite some time. And, but looking back, they were healthy questions. I think they were questions I personally had to ask. So for me, it's a little bit fuzzy. I'm not sure how long I searched, but I did my own search, mostly privately, but I certainly asked questions of trusted people. I searched for answers and I read books and I couldn't tell you which one thing was the catalyst, but I remember a book written by a guy a hundred years ago, Charles Finney, which really impacted my life. Uh, I know the writings of people like C.S. Lewis that's been mentioned, uh, a guy called Josh McDowell were a great help to me. Uh, certainly conversations again with older Christians, but truthfully it was probably just uh, reading through this book here and starting to come to some of the revelations and listening to the teachings of this person called Jesus Christ that had a real impact on me and somewhere in the following months I came to an adult conviction that the claims of Christianity are true. But here's the thing about this one, you can't prove Christianity mathematically, you can't prove it scientifically. Uh, we're a church that heartily says science matters but science answers are different to questions of faith. Science answers the questions, when and how did this world come into being? What it can't answer is the question, who and why? And I have a little bit of an example here this morning. You might have noticed I have a cake here. Now, let's have a look at this cake. I wonder how much I can tip it before it, it falls. Um, if we gave this cake to the top scientists in the world, they'd be able to tell you quite a bit about this cake. They'd be tell, able to tell you some interesting things about it. They'd probably be able to tell you the ingredients of the cake, right? Um, they might be able to tell you how it was made. They might even be able to work out when this cake was made. But what they wouldn't be able to tell you was who made it and why it was made. Now, what is the answer to that? Well, the answer is actually that myself and my wife made that cake last night and if you don't like it you can talk to her about that. Why did we make the cake? Well the reason we made the cake was for a visual aid here uh, today in church and my children tell me the reason we made that cake was to eat it at afternoon tea so there might be a couple of reasons. But my point is only the creator can tell you who made it and why. And that's the difference between science and faith. Science is important because it deals with the scientific questions. But equally, faith is really important because it answers some very fundamental questions about life. And everybody has faith. An atheist actually has faith that there is no God. Uh, you can't prove that mathematically or scientifically. But evidence and fact play a big part in us developing our faith. Those of us who believe in Jesus do so honestly on evidence. I honestly could not be a, a Christian if there was no evidence for Jesus. If I was taking some sort of blind leap of faith, I know it wouldn't work for me. And I remember working out, maybe after a hundred questions or more, and continually, uh, continually searching, that there always seemed to be another good answer as I searched out uh, Christianity. For a start, I believe there's good historical evidence about Christianity. And just to say it, uh, historical evidence is evidence. Uh, scientific evidence isn't the only kind of evidence. Think about a court of law. A lawyer uses what you might call scientific evidence. Every time a jury brings back a verdict, they're doing it on the basis of things that happened in history, evidence of history. And every jury decision then is a step of faith based on the evidence of history. So today what we're going to do is quite quickly move through some of the evidence that supports the truth about Jesus being the Son of God or ask the question, is Jesus the Son of, the Son of God? And with this evidence, 
we can make up our minds about Jesus and that ultimately can lead us to a step of faith. So I came to believe in God because of Jesus. If Jesus is real, then there's a creator and that creator is seen through the lens of Jesus. And to me, that makes a lot of sense. You can't get to know someone unless they reveal themselves to you. You can't um, let somebody know you unless you reveal yourself to that person. And if there's a God and he wanted to reveal himself to humanity, it sort of makes sense that he would reveal himself in the person of a human being, somebody that we could understand, that we could get to know. So as we look at that question, was Jesus really the Son of God? There's two parts to the argument. The first part is what did Jesus think about himself? Because if Jesus doesn't actually think that he's God, that's the end of the argument. And even if he did, the second part of the argument is obviously, is he right? There's a clip that we're about to watch that starts to deal with this first question. So let's turn our attention to the screens. Jesus of Nazareth is believed to have walked these streets around 2,000 years ago. But is there any evidence that he even existed? Well, there's actually quite a lot of evidence. No serious historian would deny that Jesus existed. The Roman historians Tacitus and Suetonius wrote about Jesus, as did the first century Jewish historian Josephus. He described him as Jesus, a doer of wonderful works. And then he goes on to describe his crucifixion and alleged resurrection. So there's evidence outside of the New Testament for the existence of Jesus, but most of the evidence comes from within inside the New Testament. And sometimes people say, well, the New Testament was written such a long time ago. How do we know what was written down hasn't been changed over the years? Well, the answer is that we do know because of a science called textual criticism. Textual criticism examines the number of copies of early texts that we have available to us today. And it looks at the time gap between the original document and the earliest copy that we have. And basically, the more manuscripts we have and the earlier they are, the less doubt there's going to be about the original. So let's compare the Bible to other texts in ancient history, ones that are widely used in schools and universities. Let's look at the Greek historians Herodotus and Thucydides. They both wrote in the 5th century BC. But the earliest copy of their writings that we have dates from AD 900, and that makes a 1,300-year time lapse. And even then, we only have eight copies of these manuscripts in the first place. Or look at the Roman historian Tacitus. There's a thousand-year gap between his book being written and our first manuscript, and we only have 20 copies. Or another classic, Caesar's Gallic War, 950 years between the book being written and our first manuscript copy. And even then, we only have nine or ten copies of these manuscripts. Again, with Livy's famous history of Rome, a 900-year gap between the book being written and our first manuscript, and we only have 20 copies of this. But when it comes to the New Testament, well, it's very different. The New Testament was written between about 40 and 100 AD, and we have manuscript evidence going back as early as 130 AD, and full manuscripts by 350 AD. And we have more than 5,300 Greek manuscripts, 10,000 Latin translations, and 9,300 others. So, you know, we can be pretty confident in the accuracy, the authenticity, and the integrity of the New Testament scriptures that have been passed down to us today. The remarkable thing about the Bible is there's such a short chronological distance between the events being described and our first manuscripts. So in many ways, the Bible scholars are in a very fortunate position of being able to check these things out and finding that they are much more reliable than, for example, some of the alternatives you're looking at. And as a scholar, I am more than happy to say, I trust this, I take it very, very seriously, I rely on it. Professor F.J.A. Hort, one of the greatest scholars in the area of textual criticism, concluded that in the variety and fullness of the evidence on which it rests, the text of the New Testament stands absolutely and unapproachably alone amongst ancient prose writings. And no secular historian would disagree with that conclusion. So we know from evidence outside and inside the New Testament that Jesus existed. But who was he? 
Well, we know that he was fully human. He had a human body. He ate, he drank, he sweated, he got tired, he suffered pain. And he had human emotions, love, joy, sadness, and human experiences. He had the experience of growing up in a family, of education, of having a job, of being tempted. And he experienced bereavement and suffering and torture and even death. Many today will say, okay, he was a human being, but only a human being. Maybe he was a great religious teacher, but no more than that. Others would say he was much more than that. Bono, the lead singer of the band U2, has said, I don't think you're led off easily by saying he was a great thinker or philosopher, because actually he went around saying he was the Messiah. That's why he was crucified. He was crucified because he said he was the Son of God. So he either, in my view, was the Son of God, or he was nuts. And I find it hard to accept that all the millions and millions of lives, half the earth, for nearly 2,000 years, have felt their lives touched and inspired by some nutter. I don't believe it. He went on to say, I believe that Jesus was the Son of God. So, if the Bible is reliable and it records the words of Jesus, what did Jesus say about himself? Well, the first bit of evidence here is that Jesus' teaching was actually centred on himself. Great religious teachers throughout history often point away from themselves and say, this is the way to God, this is who God is, and they point somewhere else. But Jesus, who personified humility, said the opposite. He actually said, look at me, come to me. He said he was the answer to the question of ultimate meaning and purpose, what our life is about. This sense of what you might call a spiritual hunger, this sense that there has to be more to life than this and there's got to be something that can fill this void, this sense that something is missing. These are the sorts of things that Jesus said. John 6.35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. If you want that hunger satisfied, you come to me. There's stuff about ourselves I'm sure every single one of us doesn't like. I put my hand up for that. I've got stuff in my life um, that is troubling. I have habits or things that I find addictive. But Jesus says, if the Son sets you free, he is saying, if I set you free, you will be free. Then there's the stuff that we carry around, worry and anxiety and fear and guilt. And Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. He's saying, if you want peace, come to me. He said, if you receive me, you receive God. In other words, if you welcome me, you welcome God. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen God, which sort of leads to a funny story. A little child was drawing a picture of God in class one time. The teacher said, what are you doing? And the child said, I'm drawing a picture of God and the teacher said that's impossible nobody knows what God looks like and the little girl looked up at the teacher and said um, well you're about to find out just a little chuckle there obviously uh, Jesus said if you want to know what God looks like look at me if you've seen me you've seen God and then there were his indirect claims Jesus claimed to be able to forgive sins he went up to people and said your sins are forgiven. Now, of course, if you offend somebody, uh, then, or if somebody offends you, you can forgive them. But uh, I just about dare you to run up to a random person and tell them that their sins are forgiven. You can't do that. But Jesus did that. And when he did do that, the lawyers and the Pharisees of the day, they said, who can forgive sins but God alone? Forgiveness is the heart of what Jesus came to do. To make forgiveness possible. It's the heart of Christianity. And then there were his direct claims. There are so many of them in scripture but today we're just going to look at one. In John 10 verse 30 to 33 Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Now that claim was tantamount to blasphemy in the time and as it happened the people around him picked up stones ready to stone him. They were going to finish him off. And Jesus said this, he said, I've shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? And they said to him, we're not stoning you for any of these, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere human being, are claiming to be God. So again, I think if you look at the evidence, and the Bible is reliable, 
it's clear that Jesus did make this claim about himself and truthfully it's an astonishing claim but of course a claim like that needs to be tested and if you think about it there's only three possibilities that can play out here either it was not true and Jesus knew perfectly well it wasn't true which makes him a fraudster uh, or else it was true and he simply didn't realize it was not true and he genuinely thought he was God and if that's the case he's deluded or he's insane but logically there's only one other possibility and that is that it is true C.S. Lewis, who's already been mentioned, he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, he says this, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He'd either be insane or else he'd be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was uh, and is the son of God or else insane or something worse. But let's not come up with any patronising nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that option open to us. He did not intend to. So let's look at the second part of the question. What evidence actually supports his claims? And again, we've got a short clip that's going to talk about that. So was Jesus right in what he said about himself? What evidence is there to support? his claims. Well the first piece of evidence is his teaching. Much of the New Testament records numerous occasions where crowds gather to hear Jesus teach. And on one occasion on a mountain like this, more than 5,000 people gathered to listen to the teaching of Jesus. The Sermon on the Mount has been widely acknowledged amongst the greatest teaching of all time. Jesus' teaching has been the foundation of our entire civilization. Many of our laws were originally founded on Jesus' teaching. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do to others as you would have them do to you. And then this, totally revolutionary. Love your enemies. In fact, we've advanced in every field of science and technology, yet in 2,000 years, no one has ever improved on the moral teachings of Jesus. They are the greatest words ever spoken. They're the kind of words you might expect God to speak. Another thing that marked Jesus' life was his love for the marginalised, feeding the hungry, healing the sick. His character has impressed millions who wouldn't call themselves Christians. Time magazine called him the most persistent symbol of purity, selflessness and love in the history of Western humanity. He was a person in whom even his enemies could find no fault and whose friends said that he was without sin. It's been said that our character is truly tested when we're under pressure or in pain. And when Jesus was being tortured, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. See, no one else in the history of the world has had a whole collection of books written about them before they were born. But Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies, 29 of them in a single day. Well, you might say, oh, what he did was he got hold of the Old Testament, which is the first part of the Bible where all these prophecies came from. And he read through the prophecies and he said, right, I'm going to go about fulfilling all of these. But the problem with that is the sheer number, 300. And humanly speaking, he had no control over so many of them. The exact manner of his death is prophesied in scripture the place of his burial his resurrection even his birth Bethlehem was prophesied it's pretty hard to orchestrate where you're going to be born and then there's his defeating of death it's the cornerstone of Christianity it's so relevant to every single person here today because statistically speaking one in one of us will die you know the Victorians in the 18th 1800s they used to talk a lot about death and not a lot about sex. Uh, we talk a lot about sex but we don't like talking a lot about death. It's something we just don't mention but nonetheless people die and when you go to a funeral and the coffin goes down into the ground it looks absolutely final and it is unless death has been conquered, unless when Jesus died and was buried he was raised to life. If he was then there's hope beyond this life. But is it just wishful thinking? It is unless there's evidence. 
What is the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus? Well, first of all, his absence from the tomb. No one has ever satisfactorily explained why Jesus' body was not there on that first day of Easter. People have come up with all sorts of explanations. Some people have said that the authorities stole the body. Well, in that case, why didn't they produce it when everybody was saying that they'd seen Jesus? They couldn't. Did you know that when the disciples heard that Jesus had been raised from the dead, they ran to the tomb and when they got to the tomb, they looked in and they saw that the grave clothes of Jesus were still there. Now that's interesting because the most valuable thing about Jesus in that moment would have been the clothes that he was wearing, but they were there and they'd collapsed like a caterpillar's cocoon when the butterfly has vanished. And the piece that had been around his head had been folded up and put in another place. And it says when they saw that, they believed. So not only his absence from the tomb, then his presence with the disciples. Jesus was seen on several occasions. Again, they're referred to directly in scripture. On one occasion, he was seen by more than 500 people. That's actually about the number of people that will come into this church over this weekend. All saw him and all on the same occasion. Now some have said, wow, it was a mass hallucination. Hallucination does occur amongst highly strung, highly imaginative, very nervous people or maybe people that are sick on drugs. But the disciples, honestly, they don't fit any of those categories. They were cynics. Think about the disciple Thomas. They were tough fishermen. They were tax collectors. Tax collectors don't hallucinate. And then there were the, the transformation of the disciples. Again, this was a group of depressed, disillusioned people. And suddenly they're going around saying, we've seen Jesus, he's really alive. History tells us that most of the disciples died pretty horrific deaths as a result of their belief that Jesus died and rose again. They were crucified, they were beheaded, they were tortured. And all they had to say was no. No, it's not true. No, we didn't see him, but they didn't. Those people would have died for something they would have known was not true, but they knew it was true because they had seen the risen Jesus. And as a result of this movement, and it's a movement without precedent in history, we know that it has grown and it is uh, without parallel. It's still happening. You know that there's actually 2,300 million Christians in the world today and just in case you think it's only a western religion it's of every ethnicity every continent every nationality every economic social and intellectual background they all speak of an encounter with the resurrected Jesus Christ so when we look at the claims about Jesus the first part of the argument it's clear that Jesus did claim to be a man whose identity was God was he deluded was he a fraud? I remember even as a teenager asking those sorts of questions and again looking at the evidence of his teaching, the things that he did, his character, his fulfilment of prophecy, his resurrection. It honestly, and I, I really understand where Bono is at when he says this, it seems illogical or unbelievable to say he was insane or he was a fraud. Now, I needed all the evidence. It was helpful to me. But what really clinched it was actually what uh, John is going to be talking about next week, the question of why did he die? See, that made sense to me. And it actually stands apart from all other world religions and starts to provide answers that make a whole lot of sense. In my journey, as I've confirmed that heart and head decision, I can say I've had a real encounter with Jesus, which has changed my life in a radical way. Far from having a sense that this is my parents' religion, this was just a faith I happened to be born into, I found a rich and a full faith. A little bit like this, or what Jesus said, he said, I've come that you might have life and have it in all its fullness. That has been my experience. Of course, it's not always easy there's ups and downs I certainly mess it up but I found it to be true Jesus is who he claimed to be Jesus really did rise from the dead there really is hope beyond this life and that encounter that I've had has changed my life 
So that's the first sort of formal session done today. And uh, I'm sure, like I did, uh, you have more questions to ask. And honestly, that is a great place to be because groups are such an important part of this whole process. And we would really encourage you to be a part of those groups and continue to ask those questions and discuss. As John has already said, uh, it's really simple. You either come with whoever's brought you today or if you're on your own or have just found your way here, you simply just make your way up um, down the, the alleyway there and there'll be people with signs and they'll guide you into a group. If I've got things right, I myself am going to sit in on one of the groups. So we'd again really encourage you to join in the groups and uh, certainly we'd invite you back uh, for next week when we look at that question, why did Jesus die? Have a fantastic week. And uh, to those of you who are regular attenders here, we always offer uh, prayer down the front if you require. Bless you heaps.